Uh, good morning, everyone. Sorry, a little technical difficulty on my part. Um, again, just like all of you, this is new to us um, in trying to do this. So I'd like to welcome you to They Came From Outer Space. This is an Abrams Planetarium Facebook Live event, and I thank you for joining us. My name is Craig Whitford, and I'm the Meteorite Collections Coordinator at the Abrams Planetarium. I'm in my fifth year as a volunteer at Abrams. I've collected and studied meteorites for 15 years and uh, really enjoy looking and, and talking to people about space rocks. Today, we'll be discussing the basics of meteorites, what they are, the differences between space rocks and earth rocks, and where to find them along with I'll share some of my favorite books on meteorites so you can continue to learn more. Uh, during this live event, please feel free to ask questions and I'll do my best to answer them. If I don't know the answer at the moment, I'll be sure to get back with you on it. Um, what is a meteorite? A meteorite is uh, simply a rock from outer space. Most originate uh, in the asteroid belt between the planets of Mars and Jupiter, um, where no planet was ever formed. The asteroid might be a rocky one, like this one here, or it might be metallic, like this one here, pretty heavy too. A few come from the moon, which has blasted off their surfaces by those gigantic impacts of the past that leave the craters that you see in the night sky. And they can take millions of years or more to even find their way to Earth. Let's talk about some terminology so that we can um, really uh, define what we're looking at. Uh, a comet, you know, which streaks through the night sky, is a small body that's made of rock and ice and dust. And it leaves a tail of gas and ice as it travels near the sun. As the sun heats it up, the, it adds to the tail. Comet trails cause meteor showers when the Earth passes through them. So that brings up the point, what is a meteor shower? And do meteorites come from meteor showers? And that's a question that we're asked quite often. Out of the annual meteor showers like the Perseids that occur in August, Meteor showers occur when the Earth travels through clouds of dust that are left behind by comets as they orbit the sun. The remaining dust particles are very tiny and burn up in our atmosphere. No meteorites at all are related to meteor showers, so keep that in mind. An asteroid, we talk about the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. An asteroid is a large rocky body that is larger than 10 meters in length or size. And uh, they're huge. And some of them are small um, planetesimals. Uh, a meteoroid is a um, small rocky body in space that's sized from microns to just under 10 meters. And these are all rough estimates. A meteor is the light emitted from a meteoroid as it enters Earth's atmosphere. So if you've ever seen a bright body burning uh, as it's coming through our atmosphere, that is a meteor. A fireball is a meteor that is brighter than the planet Venus. In many cases, people record that when they've seen a meteor enter the atmosphere and come in, that it is even brighter than the moon or the sun. And so all of those play a role in defining um, what a meteor and meteorite ultimately uh, is. A fireball, uh, a bolide is another one, is a large meteor that explodes in the atmosphere. As these meteors are entering our atmosphere at a fairly rapid rate, there's all this pressure that they've created in the atmosphere in front of them. And as they come through the atmosphere, pieces start burning off of these rocks. And actually explosions occur uh, in the atmosphere as they're entering. A meteorite, finally, 
is a fragment of the meteoroid or an asteroid that survives passage through the atmosphere and ultimately hits the ground. If you were to catch a meteor coming through the atmosphere and it hasn't touched the ground yet, it's not a meteorite. Now some meteorite basics. What they're not is a lot of times you'll get people say, well, it was hot. And so I didn't pick it up for a day to let it cool down when they had seen one come in. But meteorites are rarely hot. And many times they're often just warm or cold because they've been in space. The only part of a meteor that heats up is the outer crust of the meteorite. Just in a can be only a millimeter thick, perhaps. And this is actually a replica of a meteorite, of a famous one that uh, landed in the United Kingdom. Uh, you can see that it has a dome, and it has a lot of flutes to it. And that's what we call, uh, this one is being an oriented meteorite, came through the atmosphere, perfect, perfectly oriented, and um, created these flutes. My apologies for that. And so, um, when they come through and they fall, they're not hot. Uh, most generally, they're cold. And actually, on a recent fall um, last year um, in uh, Cuba, uh, a stone had actually bounced off the roof of one of the houses down there and uh, the occupant went out to pick it up and it was cold and she had uh, discussed that. Um, one of the other things that meteorites are not and that is covered with holes. Rocks with this feature are usually volcanic in origin and they're from earth. Um, rarely do meteorites have those holes or vesicles as we call them and um, so keep that in mind when you're looking at rocks because a lot of basalt that you find along the lake shores and in various places have these tiny holes in them, they are not meteorites. And we'll talk about what the characteristics are shortly. And thirdly, they're not radioactive. Uh, that is something that only Hollywood has provided and for the misrepresentation, um, but they are not radioactive and uh, they are safe to handle. Uh, if it's a fresh meteorite that has just fallen, you saw it fall, uh, you're out hunting for it, looking for it, the best thing to do is to not pick them up with your hands um, and preserve as much as you can for science to look at them by keeping them um, as uncontaminated as, as possible. And in many cases, picking them up with tongs and placing them in aluminum foil and wrapping them up, or if you don't have that, just in a, a good piece of paper and noting the location uh, where you found it and perhaps even taking a photograph of it before you do pick it up uh, so that it uh, shows that it, it did land on the ground and uh, that'll give you the GPS coordinates um, for location. Um, so uh, that's all important, but just keep in mind, they're not radioactive. So they're not hot, which are common misconceptions. Meteorites are not covered in holes and they're not radioactive. And that brings us to those that do have those items like that. And those are meteor wrongs. And uh, we see a lot of meteor wrongs uh, in the planetarium and on those during those events that we hold. Um, meteor wrongs are things like slag, that's been either produced locally or industrially. And those would be metals and stones and things like that, that uh, looks like a conglomerate. And it looks really weird, like it did come from outer space. Uh, most And 99% uh, of the time those, you know, or greater uh, turn out just to be slag. Uh, the other things are lava, which have a lot of holes in them, as we just discussed and are fairly light. And then um, there are a couple of naturally occurring uh, rocks on Earth, magnetite and then you have hematite. 
And most generally, those are the, the two major magnetic type of rock on Earth. And uh, those are not meteorites either. And it's good to get familiar with uh, their characteristics and, uh, and take a look at them. Generally, though, meteorites are heavier than Earth rocks of the same size. And part of the reason for that is uh, they also contain uh, nickel iron. Uh, as part of their makeup. And meteorites, um, let's see. And my magnet was hanging around here just a second ago. Let's see. And uh, so, oh, there it is. So you can see this is an iron meteorite here. And we'll talk about this one a little bit more later, but you can see, watch this. Whoa, and you actually have to slide the magnet off because of the attraction to it. So meteorites are magnetic. Even the stony meteorites, and this is a stony meteorite, is magnetic. Okay. Now, a word of caution. If you find a meteorite, especially a fresh one that's fallen, and you've seen it fall, it would be a good idea not to take a magnet to it and stick it on it to see if it is magnetic, okay? Because that actually can change the polarity of uh, the meteorite and uh, perhaps other things that would impact science. So it's always a good idea not to do that, uh, especially to a, a fresh meteorite. These we use for teaching, so just wanna show you what it is. Um, if it's a stony meteorite, and we're talking now about, and here's a beautiful uh, meteorite. And you can see the black fusion crust that's on it, this crust here. And that's what it gets as it comes through the atmosphere and just burns that outer surface. And usually it's a millimeter or less. Okay, one of the other features, and this one has a little chip on it that you can see. Let me pull it back here. So you can see the interior matrix here, how it's gray and it's light. And if you look close enough, you'll see tiny metal flakes. So this is somewhat of a freshly fallen meteorite. So it has nice black fusion crust, and many times it's almost velvety may even be a little brown and blue in color from its entry through the atmosphere and, and burning. As meteorites sit and weather, and remember the elements, especially in Michigan, anywhere in the United States, get a lot of rain, things like that. Uh, it oxidizes the meteorite and the interior and turns um, the fusion crust. This one has been totally ablated. This is from uh, the Sahara Desert uh, is where it was located. Um, gives it sort of a brown patina. But you can see the interior matrix here has oxidized from that standpoint. So, and what makes it difficult, especially in a location with a lot of vegetation, is in trying to find a meteorite that is brown, is like any other earth rock, very difficult. Um, actually, metal detectors, if they're um, set to meteorites, you might have stand a chance of finding something. But in most cases, it might wind up being magnetite. Um, the surface may also show, as I showed you in this uh, replica here, um, may show the effects of melting. And that's what this is, is melting um, as it goes, as it's coming through the atmosphere. Let's see if I can get it right here. As it comes through the atmosphere, it's melting. All of this heat and melt is being shoved to the, uh, the back side of the meteorite. And so what you get, just like on this one, is a melted surface and pieces of the matrix, the internal matrix, uh, as they're burning off, may actually adhere to the back side of this. 
And as you can see, this is another oriented uh, meteorite. It's got that dome shape, and that's one of the, the key things. Um, show that. It may also show um, what we call regmaglyphs, or these thumbprints, these um, depressions that you see here, which are fairly blunt depressions. Uh, but you can actually stick your thumb down in one of them, and that's why they're they're known as thumbprints. And this is where material has um, ablated or burned out as it's coming through the atmosphere. Um, as you notice, there are no tiny holes or anything like that uh, that we talked about with a volcanic basalt rock, things like that. Um, so these are just, you know, gently shaped from that standpoint. Um, and an iron meteorite, when it comes through the atmosphere, and here's a small piece here, an iron meteorite, uh, and many times the pressure is so great in front of these meteors as they're entering our atmosphere that it just blows, before it hits the ground, the iron meteorite apart. And in some cases, the shrapnel can be fairly sharp but it just rips it apart. And as we talked about fusion crust on a stony meteorite, irons really don't get a fusion crust. When you heat metal, it changes color. And in many cases, you get a patina. And that patina may be anywhere from blue to black, brown, um, you name it. But uh, this is an iron nickel uh, meteorite piece of shrapnel here from a fall in Russia in 1947. So uh, let's get back to basics. There are three basic types of meteorites. Uh, one is the stony meteorite here. Okay, stony meteorite. Stony meteorite uh, is made of stone, uh, has um, commonly what's known as chondrules, and I'll go over that in a little bit. And um, is attracted to a magnet, uh, things like that. Stony meteorites are basically um, space dust that over the millions and billions of years have come together uh, to form a rocky body, uh, an asteroid uh, left over from uh, the bombardment and things like that uh, in the atmosphere. Generally, 4.5 billion years old, um, and uh, pretty cool. This one's pretty heavy. Uh, this one came through the atmosphere uh, oriented, so it didn't wobble coming through. Um, when I mention chondrules, here is a slice of a fairly recent uh, meteorite fall. And if you could see all of those shiny specks there, those shiny specks are nickel iron in the matrix, okay? And if you see the round pieces, those would be the chondrules. Those are the chondrules. And uh, this is a slice that has a uh, um, no fusion crust when, what was interesting, uh, most of the rocks of this ball there's no fusion crust left on them at all. Um, but uh, such, a, such a pretty slice. Uh, for a little bit more detailed view of what chondrules look like, those are dust, uh, specks of space dust that have come together uh, and formed this rocky body uh, with flecks of nickel iron. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So um, we covered stony meteorites for the most part. Now let's talk about iron meteorites. Uh, really heavy. As you can see, it's not very large. Um, if you look at um, the deep cavities that are in this, when it came through the atmosphere, uh, material was being burned away. Uh, it has some shallow regmaglyphs left. This piece has been cut, one half of it polished, as you could see, 
and the other half has been etched with nitric acid to bring out what's known as the Widmanstatin pattern. And that pattern only occurs in space. We can't replicate that here on Earth uh, because no one would live long enough to see it happen. And what this is basically is the ejected core of a planetesimal asteroid, you name it, uh, that was right at the very center when it was ejected into space by being smashed in, in space by other rocks. Um, it became a liquid and had to cool in space. And it cools very slowly, about a degree a year, over millions of years in space. And to show you a little bit better example, of the Widmanstatin pattern. I have a piece of meteoritic iron that has been cut, polished, and etched. And as you could see, you could see that pattern that's in there. Okay? And again, that only occurs in space. These are classified by the width of each of, um, of those lines that you're seeing there. So we've done stony and we've done stony iron. And now perhaps uh, one of the most um, interesting and favorite of the types is the stony iron, or better known as a palisite. And this is a palisite that was recently uh, discovered in Africa. Um, it had been known for decades and decades, I guess, and discovered by uh, a couple of guys that uh, was on their property as they were out um, taking care of their, their crops and that. And here's the outside rind of it, or the, the crust as it's rusted. Um, on there, but uh, uh, this is a fairly old palisite. So um, the crystals um, aren't as pretty as some. And in showing you that, if we take out a slice of a palisite, As you see here, look at that, isn't that pretty? Wow. And you backlight it. Look at those crystals, huh? Aren't those crystals this pretty? Yeah. Kind of blinding though, isn't it? There we go. How's that? You get to see those crystals. Okay. And that is a palisite. Uh, these are olivine crystals. So space diamonds, if you will. Um, and actually, you can see how fractured they are. When they find unfractured crystals, they actually uh, cut them into diamonds and, inst and place them in jewelry. So if you ever want something that is out of this world for a piece of jewelry, um, see if you can find a, a peridot or olivine crystal from outer space that's been cut down and have that mounted. But... Uh, um, absolutely uh, a beautiful meteorite. So those are the three basic types uh, of meteorites. And um, we talked about a lot of the attributes. So if you were to find a heavy piece of iron, and in Michigan, most of the iron meteor, well, all of the iron meteorites actually, uh, have been fines. And that's another term. And a find is when uh, no one observed the meteor entering the atmosphere. And this meteorite was found on the ground, either in the desert or on a farmer's field, whatever it is. And most generally, these are picked up by plows and discs and things like that and drags. And, you know, they go out and they say, wow, this is heavier than normal. 
So they set it aside until they bring it into um, a planetarium or a university or something and say, hey, what have I got? Um, so the iron meteorites, as I showed you in, in uh, this specimen here, is for the most part visibly from the outside, um, if it has the features that we've talked about, you know, the regmaglyphs and things like that, um, your chances are pretty good that you have a meteorite. Now, a lot of times it's slag and that happens. But uh, just recently, um, the Abrams Planetarium acquired the Edmore meteorite uh, through a generous donation. And that had been used for 50 years as a barn door stop. Um, another one of those stories where they say, well, it was hot and I saw it fall. And it wasn't. It had been picked up by uh, farm equipment over many, many, many years because you could see the lines in the, in the uh, meteorite and things like that. Um, but the one way to tell is to go ahead and slice it off, polish it, and then etch it with nitric acid. And if a pattern does appear, your chances are pretty good that you got a meteorite. Okay. So, um, and with a stony meteorite, the same thing is true. Uh, no earth rocks have chondrules, you know, which are those little pieces of space dust, and nor are those metallic flecks that appear like that, of iron nickel. And uh, so it's easy enough just to take a little piece off of the rock that you found, go in, polish it up, and see what you see on the interior of it. Um, now, when a meteorite does fall or is found, um, they assign it a name. And most generally, that name is the town that's closest to where it was discovered. Um, the name of the post office, which may be the same as the name of the town, or of a um, or of a main um, landmark that it's near. Uh, it could be named after that. If it's found in the desert, and that's either in the Sahara, the U.S. desert, or in Antarctica, uh, it is assigned a, a name designation. So, in other words, um, if it was found in Northwest Africa, it would be NWA plus a number. So, in consecutive order that it was um, turned over for classification. So, one through, we're now into the 13,000s, I think, of uh, numbers for, especially for Northwest Africa, from that standpoint. So, um, and those are called dense collection areas uh, that are assigned so that they know that they came all from the general area. Uh, because in the Sahara, uh, because of the boundary issues and things like that, it's a little difficult to really uh, assign those a specific name unless it was seen to fall and then discovered. Um, so that's how uh, meteorites get their name. Uh, the, the sender of the rock in, for classification can often recommend a name and then just see if it's accepted or not uh, from that standpoint. So um, let's just be sure I covered most of the physical attributes of a meteorite. So we talked about the fusion crust, which is the outer rind that has been burned, and you can see the interior matrix again on that one. And we sh I showed you weathered fusion crust, which you can probably tell the difference between the two rocks. This one's brown. And this one is uh, a black. Um, we talked about the regmaglyphs or the thumbprints. And kids always like the thumbprints. They're kind of cool for kids. And uh, we talked about orientation. Um, a stone that has a dome um, to it or a shield shape as it came through the atmosphere. Um, NASA looked to meteorites to design their heat shields as they were putting together spacecraft during the Mercury missions and things like that in the early years. We talked about the interior matrix of the meteorites and for a chondral 
it is that and you can see all those little tiny flecks of space dust in there and you see how white that matrix is or gray um, that hasn't been oxidized at all hasn't been affected by water uh, which will turn those tiny iron nickel flecks into rust okay everything returns uh, back to its source uh, we talked about the chondrules that are there and again the flecks of nickel iron that you see um, we discussed the Vidman statin pattern. It's that pattern on iron meteorites that only appears on space rocks. Uh, we looked at shrapnel. What happens when a meteorite is literally torn apart in our atmosphere as it comes down? We talked about the olivine crystals, those beautiful golden crystals, okay? And uh, the they only occur in palisites. Now, um, one variety that we haven't really discussed is also a palisite, but it's known as a mesosiderite. A mesosiderite. Isn't that beautiful, too? And this is tiny fragments of stone, just like the palisite, but these are stone, these aren't crystals stone in an iron matrix and this one has been polished polished right up and those are the basic types uh, from there um, there is another uh, major type of meteorite that i haven't discussed today and we can do it for another day uh, but it's known as an achondrite so chondrites have chondrules achondrites do not Achondrites come from planetesimals, okay, such as the Moon and Mars and uh, Vesta, asteroid Vesta. And for Vesta, I actually have just one to kind of give as a teaser to show you, but this is a diogenite, probably from the asteroid Vesta. This has been cut so thin that you can put a flashlight behind it and it'll show the olivine that's in it. It's just beautiful. So, um, but there are three types of uh, Vestan uh, meteorites and we can discuss those later, just as there are types of Mars meteorites and uh, lunar meteorites uh, from that standpoint. Um, Going a little deeper, just to give you a little variety, and I don't know, probably if I hold that at an angle, you could see it better. This is a stone meteorite, a stony meteorite, and it's fairly good size, but you see the different colors in the matrix of the interior of it? And that is what happens in space when multiple different types of asteroids collide um, and then come back together, space dust, and form all these fragments and everything in there. It has to be a crazy place up there with uh, on occasion when one asteroid hits another asteroid and it just starts a chain reaction. And some of these asteroids break apart and either fragments are sent outside of the asteroid belt, maybe on their way to Earth, um, or they reform in there. Now, another way to um, tell what's happened in space, especially with stony meteorites, is uh, I had shown you a fragment of the Barwell meteorite, which has a, you know, gray, whitish matrix, all the little pebbles in it that make it up and everything. And it doesn't look like it had too much of a violent history in space. But meteorites tell us a tale of uh, their life in space, just like an astronaut on the International Space Station is writing their story. A meteorite, once we crack it open and cut it and slice it, tells us this story. And this is a slice of the Chelyubinsk meteorite from 2013. You could see all those fracture lines that are in it. That tells us it was knocked around 
quite a bit in space and came back together again and uh, you could see those black lines in those fracture lines and those are actually uh, melt lines. In other words, the stone became liquid at one point and came back together. Now in the same Chelyabinsk meteor that came in to Russia, 2013, we have slices that are almost entirely black. If you could see those grays in there too, a little bit, this means that it became liquefied in space and had to go through the cooling process and become stone again. And with this meteorite, um, many times you can have the black and the gray together in the same slice. Um, so it's really fascinating that it tells us the history um, of what it was like for it in space. So I don't know if you have any questions. I'd like to share with you a, a few of my uh, favorite books, and I'll try to put a list of these also on our uh, our Facebook page uh, so that you can always go out and try to find them. Uh, one of um, my favorite books is uh, What's So Mysterious About Meteorites? And uh, this is by Richard and Dorothy Norton. Uh, they put this together and uh, Richard Norton is uh, or Richard Norton is well known for all of his meteorite books but um, this is a great children's book uh, to go through it covers all the basics and everything and uh, that's where it's geared toward uh, Mountain Press is the publishing company on this and this was only published a few years ago so this is fairly fresh um, National Geographic has a nice little pamphlet book, again, for kids on meteors. Uh, another great recommendation here. I mentioned Richard Norton. Uh, this is um, a book that I have by me most of the time. Uh, it's a great book, Rocks from Space. Uh, this is the second edition. Uh, it's out of, pub it's out of uh, publication, but you can find it online pretty easy on any of the uh, book sites and probably even Amazon, I don't know, but uh, Rocks from Space. Um, if you want a little bit more in depth, here's Meteorite, Nature and Culture. This was produced in the uh, UK, uh, another great book. Uh, another one of Richard Norton's books, again, more in depth, is A Field Guide to Meteors and Meteorites. You can get a lot of information online, but I always like to go to the in-depth references because they always seem to be the best. Uh, here's another great book, not that big, called Meteorites, again, produced in the UK by the Natural History Museum, uh, The Story of Our Solar System, great book. Uh, collector put this one together. If you're interested in um, United States meteorite falls from 1807 to 2016, Again, 1807 uh, was the first U.S. Uh, meteorite that was seen to fall in Weston, Connecticut. And uh, so this one covers the stories of all the U.S. meteorites. Another great kids book, Impact. Okay, Impact, Asteroids and the Science of Saving the World. And then there's also, if you like stories of meteorites, The Falling Sky. And there are a couple of different uh, books like this out there, but uh, The Falling Sky, and you can find most of these online. Now, meteorites are falling all day long, every day, 24 seven. They don't stop, um, you know, from outer space, uh, as tiny as uh, smaller than grains of sand. Uh, they land on our rooftops, on our driveways, uh, in the gutters of our, our houses, and right down into the downspouts. So if you want a project, since we're all kind of cooped up, uh, maybe go out. And if you've got a catch basin at the end of your downspout, 
uh, from your gutters. And last night here, it, it really poured, so I probably have some out there. But uh, you can collect all the small dust, all the small pieces. Chances are it's going to be a glop of mud. And rinse those out and rinse those out and um, see if you can come up with some micrometeorites. And I mean, they're really, really small that you need a toothpick to move them around with and locate them. Uh, but it's something that Abrams Planetarium, uh, we're going to be working on um, over the, uh, the coming months and years um, to share with you that you can find meteorites in your own backyard off your rooftops. But uh, um, a gentleman over in Europe has uh, been studying uh, micrometeorites for some time now, and he's published several books. He has another one come out in a month. His name is John Larson. And this is on the trail to space dust. This was his latest until his next one is out in a month. And uh, it's a relatively inexpensive book. But he goes over how you can find stardust on your own. And he also shows you all the different types of environmental um, pieces that you might find if you're cleaning out your gutters and things like that. But uh, John also wrote In Search of Stardust, and there are two editions of this. And believe it or not, I think in some places you can get all three books for $20, $25. Um, so, you know, it's a great educational thing uh, to look out and see how the uh, industries also provide the debris that uh, we see. So finding micrometeorites, you have to sort through all of that. Uh, to find them. But um, uh, those are some of my favorite books um, so that you can you can read online. I, I'm sorry, you can either read the books online or try to pick them up at uh, your favorite spot. Um, but uh, with that, uh, um, we're always uh, available to answer questions. Uh, I don't mind ever looking at uh, possible meteorites. Uh, the patrons have found. Uh, many universities and institutions, I think the United States is down now to about two or three uh, that will even look at uh, rocks from citizens simply because 99.999% of the rocks that are brought in are not meteorites. They're just terrestrial rocks. And uh, so most of the universities have not put their resources to uh, having the public walk rocks in and uh, try to figure out whether they're meteorites or not. There is a, a private company that'll do it uh, for a fee uh, if you have one, but I'm always open to take a look and try to um, educate and show you what makes a space rock as opposed to an earth rock. And uh, I'll never probably stop doing that because half of the known Michigan meteorites have all been fines and not seen to fall. So that tells me that there's still meteorites out there, especially since uh, the Edmore meteorite, which was used as a barn doorstop, just came to light not more than just a little over a year ago. Uh, so it's always possible uh, there. But um, uh, with that, uh, I'd like to, to do a little bit of housekeeping for Abrams Planetarium. Um, we have other Facebook live events uh, every um, Tuesday and Thursday at 10 a.m. There's Celestial Story Time on um, Wednesdays at on Mondays at 10 a.m. There's Experiment Along, and um, if today's event went well for meteorites and you'd like to see more uh, meteorites, we can cover a whole host of subjects, including the Michigan meteorites, we could talk about the moon, Mars, and Vesta. Um, and there are, are other possibilities as well. Uh, maybe we'll be doing this again. Uh, on top of that, uh, the name our Mars rover is over. That's kind of funny, isn't it? Our Mars rover is over. Um, uh, that ended April 5th. I do know that uh, in talking with uh, the director, Shannon Schmoll, that the students have made their three selections, and she's going to try to get that up on Facebook for a poll uh, today yet, uh, so that you can select uh, what name you think our Mars rover should be. 
Um, and also with that, we have a new exhibit opening. Uh, it was supposed to open. It's supposed to open in September of this year. We're still hopeful that it will. Um, we still have a lot of work ahead of us, but uh, it will feature our meteorite collection, um, with the Michigan meteorites being front and center. Uh, you'll actually be able to touch a meteorite from the Moon, Mars, and Vesta, and uh, we'll tell stories along the way uh, that you'll be able to enjoy. Uh, we have a couple of touchscreen monitors that the kids will be able to use, and uh, it should be very fun. Uh, we have a mascot that we'll be rolling out here in a bit uh, to share with you, but uh, it's an exciting time. And uh, lastly, um, we'd encourage uh, donations during this time uh, while our doors are closed and that, and that helps with our programming, uh, helps with everything that we do uh, for you uh, to keep you coming to the Abrams Planetarium and enjoying the skies at night and during the day. And with that, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today and keep your eyes on the sky. This is Craig Whitford from Abrams Planetarium. Thank you.